Welcome back to the second town hall for the Michigan High School Lacrosse Coaches Association. My name is Greg Norman. We're lucky enough to have with us the defending national champion coach for Virginia, Lars Tiffany, and John Torpy, the head coach at High Point. And guys, what we're talking about this year and this week in these town halls is we're, we're kind of talking about getting ready for the season. And I want to sort of two approach it. Start with, and John, I'm going to start with you. Talk a little bit about coming out of fall. You're coming back from the Christmas break. Talk a little bit about what you're doing with your coaching staff before kids show up, before the kids actually show up on campus, what you're getting ready for. Yeah, we didn't have that much time uh, with the guys coming back January 4th because we open up next week against Maryland. But uh, there was definitely some uncertainty, some concern about the Omicron and, and COVID and kind of where we were going to be at this point. But um, fortunately, we've gotten through a good majority of that. Uh, guys have tested negative the last couple of weeks. So we've been able to have some practices. But I mean, for us right now, and I think like most programs, we're still a bit of a work in progress. I think we have a really good idea of what we are doing from an X's and O's perspective and kind of who we want to be, um, you know, in terms of the ride, the clear, the face-off, face-off wings, offense and defense, man up, man down, um, based on our personnel. But we're still trying to figure out some pieces of the puzzle in terms of our personnel. So we come out of a scrimmage this weekend against Mount St. Mary's and Air Force, but that's, I think, some really good answers. Um, but we're still going to be doing some evaluation this week. And I think, uh, you know, we're playing a fair amount of younger guys. I didn't think we would be at that point this uh, at, um, at this stage in the season. But with some injuries and with some things that have happened, we've got some younger guys that are stepping up, doing some things for us. And so, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how those guys perform against uh, such a high-level opponent this week. And hopefully that gives us a couple more answers as well. Lars, when you come back off of the, you know, the, the, the seasons you've had, do you feel more pressure coming back and getting ready? Does there some things you think about to do differently to stay on top of the, the mountain? I mean, there's definitely pressure, but we try to embrace the pressure. We talk about it with our men all the time. Pressure is a privilege. You know, if, uh, if we did something that and played a sport or were part of a team that didn't get a lot of attention, uh, then, um, you know, that'd be fine. But that's not why you choose to play Division One lacrosse and, and certain schools. You, you, you understand that that will be there. So we feel the pressure, but we try to talk about it and, and put it aside. Um, but but you, the better part of the question is, do you change things? And that's the challenge, right? Because, you know, when you've had success, it could be so easy. Like, oh, this is, this is what you do. You know, college football, whoever wins a national championship, what do they do in the weight room? We got, we got to, it must be the weight room, right? Let's follow what they do. I mean, there were some things we, we did the last couple of years that, you know, maybe had nothing to do with the success we had. And, and we, so you try to continue to be dynamic, you know, and Coach, Coach Torpy's on this call and, and I've, I've learned a lot coaching against him and preparing for his teams and coaching against him. And he's very innovative. Um, and so you, you, I feel like as a coach, I don't want to get too settled in. You know, who's really good at this is John Tillman. John Tillman's Maryland teams, they're multidimensional. Um, whereas some of our opponents, you just know they're not changing. This is the way they clear the ball. This is what their man up looks are going to be like. Um, and then with Coach Torpy and Coach Tillman, you know, they're always, they, they keep you on your toes. You don't know what to expect. So for ourselves at Virginia, we are trying to find a balance of, okay, what is our bread and butter versus, hey, let's take a look at our ride. Is our ride as effective as it used to be? You know, what about our clear? And so we are trying to be dynamic without Again, it's as coaches, the coaches on this call right now, not doing too much, right? That, you know, if you have too many different versions of the clear, if you have too much going on, maybe you sort of handcuff yourself, the analysis by paralysis. So, um, but yeah, we, we, we were constantly probing. Um, it, it reminds me of that quote, you know, uh, Coach Torpy's alma mater when uh, Urban Meyer was there. I remember some, uh, one of his assistant coaches saying, uh, you know, if, if it ain't broke, uh, Urban will fix it. Uh, you know, he was always meddling, you know, and overanalyzing, but tremendously successful at the college level, certainly. So we're just um, trying to find that balance. Question to both of you. So I'll start with John. Do you guys script it like on a whiteboard of what you want to accomplish? And is it real clear in how it happens in, in, in your approach to things, John? Uh, is that fair? Yeah, I think we do. Um, we do that kind of going into the fall and then it kind of changes uh, a great amount after the fall. So we do that before Christmas and then we'll do that kind of as we get back as well. But, um, you know, like Lars said, I mean, you're always tinkering with things and figuring things out and playing against great opponents. I mean, like these guys, I mean, having the opportunity to play against some great teams early in the season, like Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, Duke. I mean, these guys will expose any weakness that we have. 
Um, and so I've always appreciated what we've gotten out of those games, win or lose, just because we're learning so much about ourselves, so much about our personnel, kind of what we can do at a high level, what we can't do at a high level. And, um, you know, while we think we can sit there and we joke about it all the time, like we'll sit there and put together what we think is a great clearing scheme or what we think is a great riding scheme and then we'll go out on the field and, uh, you know, in about two seconds, it just implodes. Um, but our, I think our ability and I think coaches ability is just to be able to adapt on the fly and look at certain things and figure things out as we go and, you know, steal things from teams that we're preparing for. I'm looking at Maryland's offense right now. And I know Lars can attest to this, having played those guys in the national championship. Um, man, they're like death by a million paper cuts. They can do so many different things. They have so many different guys. And I think the world kind of thought like, oh, Bernhardt's graduated. You know, they're going to be um, a little bit lesser version of where they, you know, where they were in 2021. But you look at the guys that they have coming back and you look at some of the pieces of the puzzle that they've added and, um, you know, it's ever changing. So, yes, we do figure things out. We have some core fundamental, you know, affirmations and, and principles that we live by. But, uh, you know, our ability to adapt has got to be a lead if we're going to you know, try to stay on top of our conference and have a chance of competing against some of these great teams. Lars, you had a – I'm going to get to the same question, but I want to ask this question. I listened to a podcast that you and your Brown uh, play, uh, teammate, Jamie Monroe, had about a week ago. You guys spent a bunch, bunch of time talking about a variety of things. And there were some new wrinkles to even your conversation with Jamie. So think about that from the standpoint of – is it, is it always constantly thinking about what's next? And the, the follow-up question to it is, for somebody like John, can innovation be the difference between being competitive with a team like High Point as compared to a team like Virginia or Maryland who may have a little more talent? I'm not just dishing on you, John. I'm just – I mean, think those kinds of programs would attract a slightly better quality athlete. Is that a fair statement? The um, – <laughs> yeah, I mean, for – First of all, Torps and I both have a special connection to Jamie Monroe because Torps and, and Jamie coached together for a lot of years. And so that must have been some crazy jam sessions on the chalkboard or grease board, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, and Jamie would inevitably call me, Lars, I got this great idea. You got to try this. You got to try this. You know, go over the head on the GL lead and slide from the crease. Where's the attack? I'm going to protect the stick. You know, and stuff like that. And, you know, two days later, I'd be like, hey, Jamie, I was thinking about, it. Lars, forget that idea. I got a better idea. I got a better idea, you know? <laughs> And so I just could just imagine, you know, John and I'm living together. At least me, I, I could have the choice of not answering the phone when Jamie calls with his crazy ideas. Right. right. But um, you know, but but he did, he does make me uncomfortable in a good way. He Jamie was always probing me and making me rethink things about what is going to be and what is innovative. And so I, I do think, you know, and, you know, and I was mentioning John Tillman earlier, but I feel like that's a guy like if somebody comes up with a great man down defense or a great way to clear the ball. Maryland will be running it the next year. They will they will analyze it and be like, wow, that is really good compared to how teams clear or compared to how teams play man up for now at this phase. Things will change down the road. Um, but yeah, being innovative is is critical. Um, and so I, you know, and I think Torpy does a really good job with that with his high point team uh, of playing a certain style and the way they attack in the 66 offense. It certainly helps to have great players. He's got Asher Milty behind, a couple of Canadians who can score. Had a couple of great middies last year. I'm glad they left. Um, but I'm sure he's got more coming in. But the way they probe, especially that low wing, is, is really innovative. To get to your question that we asked both of us, script it out. I will say, you know, it's, you got to be careful as a coach because some of us want to be like the football coach where you reset the pieces every five seconds, right? And it's a flowing game. It's a, it's a, it's a, but you do want to script what you can. And um, just for the coaches listening, there's a, you know, a lot of us college coaches do some sort of version of this to get their drill the day before a game where it's like, okay, uh, man up face off and everyone, the man up face off runs out there. Okay, uh, man down clear, boom. And just, we just walk through that for five minutes a day before a game um, every time, just to make sure that part of the script is well mapped out as opposed to day of the game, like, oh, geez, we're man up. Who's on, who's, who's on the wing? And just to take care of that stuff. But both of you guys, could high school coaches benefit from using the clock on a practice situation, because probably everybody in college does. And what mistakes do you see some of your younger coaches making as it, re as it relates to script and taking the, the, the stuff off the whiteboard and walking out to practice? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I, I was I saw a quote this past Christmas by Gary Patterson, the, the football coach at UTU. And he was talking about, you know, two different kinds of coaches. There's a coach that's really good in terms of putting together PowerPoint presentations and, 
talking about um, some sort of blanket statement, things that happen in the sport and being able to talk about their, you know, system of development and how they do things and, you know, how they would um, go about attacking certain situations. But there's another coach that he talks about that's really good in timeouts and figuring things out, um, being able to put things in a really simplistic term for guys when things aren't working. And so for us, uh, we try to create a lot of situations in practice that are very gray uh, for our guys and things that, you know, are going to happen during the course of a, a play in, in a very fleet, free flowing sport. And, you know, every, every now and again, we'll let the guys play out those scenarios, but then we'll stop and kind of talk about them as well, bring the team in and just say, Hey, this is something that we could do here. This is something that we could do there. And uh, you know, constantly calling like, 30 second timeouts to see if our defense can fix whatever the offense is doing to us or whatever the, the offense is doing to the defense, defense, to the offense, just doing things like that all the time to not only put the players in uncomfortable positions, but to put our staff in uncomfortable positions. And um, I, I tell you what, I, I've really enjoyed kind of learning like that. And I think uh, when there's an air of vulnerability with your staff amongst your players, it just endears you to them. And uh, there's a lot of questions that we ask to them. There's a lot of things they ask to us during the course of those situations that uh, kind of builds a really cool bond between ourselves and our players. John, I didn't mean to, to suggest that High Point doesn't have athletes like Virginia <laughs> or Maryland. It's just you've got a great program and you've recruited great kids. And I certainly, with your relationship with Jamie, you've got to you got to keep your ears open because it's it's one of those things. Um, I just think I think part of what high school coaches don't do enough of is situational. Uh, game situation for for practice and I think that's part of that package that I think we sometimes forget because they've got two hours to pack in a bunch of stuff so and, and you may not have the manpower to have someone run run the clock over there but if you got if you can get your access to a scoreboard and uh and, and an injured guy to run it it it's it's helped tremendously I you know Jamie speaking of Jamie Monroe he he'd call me like, you don't film practice. I'm like, I already watched practice. I was there, you know, but you know, so I started filming practice about 10 years ago when I was at Brown and then I started doing more clock. So I spent a lot of years as a head lacrosse coach at the college level, not having a clock on a practice. And I had it on my watch. I loved it. My assistants hated it. Cause you know, if I wanted to drill, go a couple more minutes, I would, you know, I was in charge. They love having the clock during the entire practice, you know, seven minutes for this drill, 10 for that. They know when the drill's ending, so they can kind of time things up, and I'm, and I'm not allowed to extend it. So uh, so having it, but I will tell you this for sure. Like today, when we in our scrimmages with Navy and Lynchburg, we had three or four situations, end of quarter, and we were aware in all of them. When I was at Brown, before we had a clock at practice on drills, we would inevitably, like most of the time, have no idea where the clock was. And so just by having a clock at practice has trained our men uh, naturally to be attentive to it late in a quarter, late in a shot clock. So if you can get a clock at practice, um, it's tremendously helpful. Lars, and I'll start with Lars on this one. If you've got a 12 minute segment in practice and seven and a half minutes into it, you realize that it's, it's a negative return, just not working. Do you allow yourself the flexibility to jump off that drill and to do something else? Or are you the kind of guy that stays with it until it gets done right? Yeah, I mean, if, I'm kind of I, I like to stay with the script. I'll admit, I'm a little football play, coach just like that, that, you know. And there's someone over there is recalling the clock, and they've got the practice plan. So I, I tend to let it go. Um, but you know, certain scenarios, I might be like, all right, just just it, you know, blow the whistle. All right, next water break. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I tend to, and, and 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 I'm lucky too because I've had the same staff that I had in Providence, Rhode Island. You know, Kip Turner and Sean Kerwin came down, and so we've been together for so long. Kip was being with me 12 years, Sean for, gosh, it's getting close to eight or nine years now. And so we kind of know the script and kind of know our drills. Okay. John? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. We, um, we have so many lengthy conversations in the office before we would even go out and do something new. We talk through kind of any sort of cracks that would happen, any good situations, any bad situations we could get out of it. And uh, we've got such a great rapport amongst our staff with myself, Kenny, uh, Justin, and Bryce that, you know, we will kind of chop apart or cut apart any drill that's kind of a new idea or something that we've talked about or maybe done in the past. And when we leave the office, we're, you know, so much of a unified front um, where we're always going to kind of, you know, back each other. And we haven't had a whole lot of situations where drills that maybe we've come up with or drills that we want to explore that we've done a couple of years back, we haven't followed through on. Um, but I'll go back to kind of the question before about the clock. And I'll tell you a cool story. 
in the fall of 2018, a buddy of mine who I, I know Lars knows, who's the sports information director at UVA, this guy, Eric Bacher, um, you know, we, we, I, I love watching college basketball practices. And there was a big part of me that wanted to watch UVA's basketball practice. I watched them before in 16, was enamored with Tony Bennett. I'm like, this guy's incredible. And so we were fortunate enough to bring our staff up there. And you're kind of wondering kind of how they would bounce back from the loss to UMBC. Uh, this was the year that they ended up winning the national championship, but it was still early in the season. And I think one of the things they were doing in practice to combat the fact that, you know, they were playing really slow basketball the year before and kind of taking everything to the deeper part of the shot clock was they had a scrimmage segment where they would play with a 15 second shot clock and they would play with a normal shot clock and then they would flip halfway in between. So they had this like really fast paced up tempo version of basketball that they played to kind of counteract what happened to them the year before. And they also had their original brand of, of UVA basketball. And uh, it was really telling to me as we went into the 19 season, I was like, man, this is really cool. So we started doing these like kind of chaotic scrimmages where we were going with a 40 second shot clock and everything was just up tempo. And then we played with, you know, the actual shot clock. And um, it was really cool to see kind of our team be able to run our offense and do different things at a, at a, at a high, you know, a pretty high, high paced, uh, you know, clip with even playing with the clock and then, you know, how it turned into really good lacrosse, you know, when we didn't have the clock. So um, we attribute a lot of the success that we had that year just to be able to go and watch that and be a part of that and, and, and witness that. Early part of my career, when I got into the New York Times management program, they had a seminar that was considered to be don't assume. And the first question they asked us at the seminar was, what do you think the most four important things is for a new hire? And it turned out the thing that was second on the list was where the bathroom was on the first day of work. Now, that would have never hit me as anything that was important because I would want to know how much money I made and where my job was and where I sat. But apparently the toilet was something that was important. But what the point, what, the, what they were trying to tell us was don't assume. And I think sometimes young coaches and beginning, you know, guys getting in the first part of their career assume a lot. And if you've got guys coming to a college campus, it's no different than a high school kid, a freshman coming out for, does that something that you know the first few days of your practices that you don't have to assume you got to cover all the bases? Is that a fair, is that a fair question? I'll start with you, John. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's almost like you're erasing. I mean, for us, we're getting a lot of guys from non-traditional areas that are, you know, really good athletes, but not necessarily um, high IQ lacrosse players that are playing in games you know, against kids that, you know, where a team might have 30 kids going to the division one level or have that, you know, 15, 20, 30 guys of, a, of an MIA school or a St. Anthony's or a Chaminade on their own team. Um, you know, so they get away with a lot of bad habits. And I think the guys we tend to fall in love with um, aren't necessarily the guys that connect the pieces, those like flow guys or those great off ball guys. You know, we do look for them. We look for a lot of those guys in those traditional hotbed areas. But a lot of the guys that we end up falling in love with are starters and finishers of plays. And so, you know, when a kid is asked to hold the ball on his stick for 70 to 80 percent of his team's offense or their offenses, give the ball to Joey, let him run the score to put that kid in a position where now he's in front of a Dodger, he's behind a Dodger, he's two passes away from a Dodger. Um, it takes a long time to get those guys to where they need to be. And then I think also like a lot of the skills that they're able to get away with being good athletes from non-traditional areas they would they wouldn't tend to work at the division one level so there's a lot of kind of resetting their thinking um resetting their mindset a lot of hey listen we know you can do this well that's the reason why you're here but we need you to try these three or four other things too and uh it's it's one of the fun things about being a coach at a place like this is you've got so many different things you can do with guys and so many different ways you can you can develop them and we've really prided ourselves on creating this really cool system of development and to be honest with you you know, it's all, it's all thievery, man. We steal from Lars, we steal from Tills, we steal from great programs. We look at what some of the other programs that are in the wheelhouse like us that maybe aren't getting the traditional blue blooded kids, you know, to get, to get to their campus, what they're doing and how they're doing it, maybe from a schematic standpoint or development standpoint. But yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely not um, a part of us that feels like we're getting the finished product when guys get here. Lars, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'll give you the more of the boring answer at first. So we, we hit them all on alcohol awareness. Like, you know, it's like they're being let loose on a college campus, you know, whether it's, uh, 
you know, an Ivy League campus or, you know, down in North Carolina, whether the county's dry or not, you know, or uh, certainly in Charlottesville, it's it, you just we spend a lot of time just trying to ensure that the onboarding process is taking them to the field to go shoot, you know, upperclassmen, don't take these freshmen there, you know, take them there, not, not straight to the keg. Um, the biggest thing that, you know, and maybe I'm biased because I'm a defensive coach is, you know, most of the defense we bring in have so much to learn. That is the biggest transformation is going from high school defense to college defense, um, high school offense to college offense. There's a change, but most of us, when we're, you know, when, when I was a high school coach, you could watch a college offense and just by watching the film, you could get a lot of it. College defense, you got to, it's the communication, the calls, the differentiations, the fake slides, the true slides, adjacents, the creases, all these different things that are going on. There's so much. So that to me is the biggest impact. And so Jamie Monroe, I keep bringing up his name. It's like, how do you discover that in the recruiting process? Is this somebody who, when you bring him to your campus, is going to be able to pick up uh, college level slide schemes and multiple packages, or is this going to be difficult? Um, and, and it's not hard to tell. It's not easy to, to dif differentiate that while you're on a summer sideline at a recruiting tournament. Um, we talked about if you could have guys play three on three basketball during an official visit, I'm not supposed to watch that, you know, but you know, what, what could really help, you know, and I, I put guys on a board now, um, every defensive recruit who comes in, I, I put them on the grace board and, um, it doesn't always tell me a ton, but sometimes it shows me, wow, this guy has no idea what I'm talking about. And so I've got to accept that I'm going to teach him a lot or this guy does have high IQ. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right or wrong answer because he's been trained a certain way. Right. But does he think in the spatial intelligence and does he understand some things? So we're trying to steal from that. And I got that from Brown football, you know, Brown football, the, the old line coach, he makes sure that every recruit, you know, he gets 20 to 30 minutes to talk about offensive line protection schemes and they get a bit of an assessment that way. So a little John Gruden, sort of the quarterback stuff. You know, it's kind of fun. Yeah. And you know, those, I feel, I feel bad when the guys who are not prepared and they struggle and their mom and dad is trying to help them, you know, trying to wink or like, you know, right. and, and, uh, and so then I back off and sometimes I don't recruit them based on it to tell you the truth, you know, both you guys have mentioned stealing from the other guy, like physics, which there hasn't been anything new since the 1920s. Is there really anything new in lacrosse as much as just, just been recycled and maybe slightly altered? Is there something that we're not looking at that you guys might see from a high school perspective? An example is that we're using this year for the first time, your two, two, two from X as an offense, because if I, I got two guys that can can't move, but they got cannons. So now I put them on top of my offense and I can, I've got four guys that can catch and pass. I got somebody that can shoot the ball. So my point to it is, is that you kind of did that for your 2019 championship. Is there anything new in lacrosse? There's nothing truly new. But the point of emphasis you're seeing with the two-man pick game, obviously, for the last 10, 15 years from box across and basketball, um, we spend so much time as a defense defending picks, you know, compared to when I first got into this business 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the other thing that's not new, but you're going to see a ton more is the 10-man. It's become a staple. And I'm seeing more and more high school teams doing it as well, but certainly the college level. Um, Navy was 10-manning us today. Um, it just, it's just going to be much more common. Um, so, but I'll leave it to Torps because if there's anybody who's going to throw something brand new in Charlottesville, Virginia, two weeks from today, and I'm, I'm going to have to deal with it, it's, it's John Torpy. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with Lars on that one. Um, I know for us, you know, one of the big things that we're hitting on a lot being in a position where we're playing a lot of like double game weekends and two day turnaround games is just recovery for our athletes. And uh, we've really like delved into a lot of cool and new things that we can do with our guys, devices, things of that sort. Um, and that's been a big thing for us. In terms of X's and O's, um, you know, I just, I'm sure a lot of the stuff is stuff people were doing in the past. Um, you know, I remember having a conversation with Fred AC one time and somebody was running a new zone and he's like, man, we did that, you know, 27 years ago, you know, and so like, uh, I'm sure uh, most of the stuff that we think is new has been done a million times over. But uh, I just love I love watching, you know, our guys do something unique on the field. I love talking to guys that are passionate about development. I love, you know, watching different sports and seeing different things guys do. I think for us, you know, one of the things that we're trying to, you know, really put a premium on this year from an offensive perspective is different spots of the field that we can dodge in that defenders maybe have never been to before. 
and how we can manipulate and run our offenses based on that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm with Lars too, man. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you used to know that you could maybe play two or three teams a year that would give you a, a 10 man on a, a 50 to 60 to 70% clip on their ride. But now, I mean, you know, we played yesterday against Air Force at Mount St. Mary's and, you know, I'm sitting there talking to Tom Gravani and, and Billy Wilson before the game. We're like, you want a 10 man? Sure. Let's 10 man. And uh, just the little things that you find when you 10 man, <laughs> the situations that occur from a substitution standpoint, to, you know, different situations that happen in transition, um, you know, situations you give up in the middle of the field and plays that guys make. I mean, it is just a wild style of lacrosse. And I mean, <laughs> Lars and I can tell you, man, from playing each other the last couple of years, there's been some crazy situations that have happened in our games that, you know, would make most coaches head spin in terms of the, you know, shots generated and, you know, going down the field and it's, you know, six defense or uh, six offensive guys playing three defensemen and three of the guys on offense or defense. I mean, it's just, it's a wild style, but it's, but it's fun, you know, and it's exciting. And um, it's neat to see the scenarios that play out with those, uh, with those things. It's a real quick question to, to you, Lars, and then come back to John. Do you think high average high school, I'm not talking about those, those special programs. Do you think the average high school program can run a 10 man? I think they should be. I mean, uh, cause they're probably playing, other average high school lacrosse programs. And how are they gonna score from 70 yards away? Or how are they gonna throw a 70 yard pass to the wide open guy who's deep attackman in the corner? I mean, I, I, why not? I, I, you know, but it, again, you have to, as a coach, you have to understand, you can't keep saying, stop sliding up field. Cause you're saying slide up field, <laughs> you know? You know, some of that may be a sort of golden rule. Don't slide up field defense. Um, but I, I absolutely, you know, if I was coaching high school, we would be 10 manning a ton because you're really asking the other team, the clearing team to, to make some really nifty looks and, and make some plays. In. And if they can't pass very well, it's a great, obviously it's a great defense. So, I mean, it works from that standpoint. I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, first of all, shout out to my man, Jamal Robertson. I'll see you down there, buddy. My fellow Buckeye. Um, when, <laughs> uh, when Jamie and I used to, uh, used to coach, before I keep bringing up Jamie Monroe, but um, we used to coach an all-star team out in uh, out in Colorado, this Mile High all-star team, and it was a conglomeration of like pretty good players, you know, from different high schools. And we would do like this like neutral zone trap type ride at these club oh, events. Yeah. And we used to joke that like the defenseman should only have to pay half because nobody could ever get the ball over the midfield line. You know, <laughs> you look at like the the deficiencies that high school kids have in terms of like the way they pause when like a shot is taken both on the defensive end and the offensive end um, there are deficiencies in terms of the decision-making they make in the clears, you know, because a lot of times it's give the ball to Joey, let him run it out type of thing. And then just the fact that the ride is kind of this thing that, that nobody will talk about. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with Lars anymore. I mean, I, I think if you do those things at the high school level and you go over it, you know, you're practicing four or five days a week and you go over that two or three, two or three days, um, there's going to be a lot of teams that really struggle. I mean, I've seen high school clears outside of, you know, the better programs in the country and, and rides. And, and uh, quite honestly, it's a mess at a lot of places. I, I went to the Mount Sinai Manhattan game last summer, you know, the Long Island championship. And one team was 10 many other, the other team, it's a really good program. They couldn't clear. They didn't have an answer for it. So, you know, even good high school teams struggle against it. I mean, you see some good college across programs struggle against 10 men. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm definitely a big proponent of it. Okay. I want to keep us on our time frame. I just have two more questions. One, talk a little bit about, you guys have had three or four weeks to get ready. Your first games are coming up this Saturday. You guys are both playing uh, the opening contest for your NCAA season. What have your guys done the last three or four weeks? And I, my question is directed at, you're now talking to a bunch of high school kids who might be playing one day a week on Saturdays and doing a little wall ball. What, what would be a benefit to them from your perspective, a, a tip that you might be able to give them or a coach to what could they concentrate on over the next three or four weeks before we get started here in the early part of March? I would certainly uh, conditioning. Um, it really helps us coaches if the guys come back in shape, because no matter what, I, there's been some preseasons I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta grind these guys or in other preseasons, you know what, let's make sure we don't have a bunch of guys injured for the first scrimmage no matter what, it's going to be more volume and more intensity than what they've been doing. And if, if they're not in shape, they're going to get injured more. They're going to get more nicked up. 
And so just begging the guys that that last month before preseason lacrosse starts up, making sure they're running. You can't recreate it at basketball. You can't because you get to change of direction uh, and the lateral footwork and, and those type of muscles. But, you know, firstly, come back in as best shape possible and then um, yeah, and having that stick as sharp as possible, whether it's the wall box, they have no friends uh, to play with or, you know, what are they doing with their stick work? So just so because you all of us coaches here, we got these ideas. You want to run this 10 man ride, little zone offense. But, um, you know, and so but if you have to oh, wait a minute, we got to get our shells in shape and we got to really focus on stick work. Ugh, it it kind of kills your teaching moments. Darren, let me come back to you. I just want to ask Lars one more question. Everybody, all the evidence, the empirical evidence suggests we all get in shape in different times and different places because we're not all the same body. We don't all have the same lung capacity. Do you let your guys get in the, the game shape based on what you do in practice? Because again, a guy six five doesn't get as quick as doesn't isn't in his shape. The guy's you know five foot eleven, and he's yeah. He's we're trying to do it with our drills. We're trying to you know as as I'm emphasizing for them at home, you know, for those uh, three four weeks before practice starts, to be doing the sprints and the runs and the interval training and and a circuit type weight room training. Um, you know, we're trying not to do sprints and not in practice. That you know the drills we set up are are intense and competitive and so that they play themselves into shape, you know, lacrosse shape, I should say, once, once we do start practicing. Bill Turney said last week, he does his Monday mile and they do a six minute mile, but he says, he's got guys running in five fifteen, He's got guys running in seven twenty. He doesn't care what they run as long as they run the mile, it's just something he carried over from his, from way back in Princeton days. Yeah. And he keeps there. He says, it's not a punishment drill. He just wants to make sure that they're coming off of a weekend where they're getting in shape. And it, you know, the more they, work and more they exercise obviously the better shape they're going to get so I, and my point is that i think sometimes high school coaches want these guys to become cross-country runners instead of lacrosse players exactly and it, it, do whatever you can once practice starts to be having game-like scenarios where the conditioning is occurring with a lacrosse stick and lacrosse decision making happening combined jack you follow up on that yeah i agree with everything lars said um you know, I'm a big proponent of the beep test. I, I really do like that with our guys. Um, we do that when we first get back with our guys. Uh, there's a change of direction element in it. There's, um, you know, uh, a stamina based element to it. But what I love about it the most is it celebrates the guy who wins, not the guy who finishes last. And, uh, you know, I remember playing at Ohio State, we used to do the two mile test and everybody's clapping the last guy through at the end while the first guy's, you know, finishing in complete and utter silence. So that's, that's a test that I've always been a big fan of uh, with our team. And it's been a good gauge for us over the last couple of years, but uh, I'd, I'd add on top of that, just, we try to do a lot of stuff like from a player driven perspective. And I think it's important for coaches, especially high school coaches, you know, with the limited amount of time you have with guys, give your guys some sort of base, um, you know, template of this is going to be our defense, this is going to be our offense, so that the older guys on the team, the captains of the team, can really take a leadership role and start to teach that to the guys that they're going to be working with, especially some of the younger guys who maybe have never played before. And uh, that element of being able to do that, I think, really starts to, you know, make you a master of that. And it also, um, you know, kind of just gives you another coach on the field. I mean, we're, you know, half the time we're playing, we're 60 yards away from the action. And the more you can have guys out on the field that know what they're doing and can control things out there, you know, the better off you're going to be. So with the conditioning, with the basketball, you know, with the stick skills, there's also an element of just being great off ball and teaching um, that I think you owe it to your players to allow them to have, have some ownership in that. John, being a former, well, not a former, being a Buckeye, playing your lacrosse in a track stadium named after Jesse Owens, was there any pressure to, to be in shape from a track athlete standpoint, having played, because they play in the shoe now, but they played those days, they, I'm assuming that you guys played in the Jesse Owens. Yeah, when, when, when Bresh was out there, and I'm sure it's not this way anymore at North Carolina, because I think part of it was trying to get us in shape and part of it was trying to get half the team to quit. Um, but, uh, <laughs> we definitely, uh, we definitely nicknamed ourselves the lacrosse country team because we'd run like three, four miles every day. And, and, uh, I would, I would not wish that on my worst enemy. So yeah, there, there was always that, uh, Jesse Owens looming over you, but it wasn't sprints. It was more, uh, more distance. Both you guys were uh, side note, both you guys were in Ann Arbor to watch a football game. I believe this fall, <laughs> some emails that came back and forth. We got spotted in the stadium. We didn't get a chance to catch up with you, but how did you enjoy your time in Ann Arbor? 
Well, I, I probably it. had a better time <laughs> than Torpy. <laughs> It was disappointing I, to say the least. I was definitely in the parking lot running my mouth beforehand. <laughs> I was, was humbled and booed as I left in the third quarter and went to a pizza place with my family and got booed when we walked in there too. So tough, tough day. Oh my <laughs> God. It's, Rob uh, Dameron's, like, had, Rob it was, Dameron's it, on this call. So we we're a couple of Spartans. I had to, I had to at least get, I see you had to get that one in uh, for the boys. Wanna, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not necessarily a Harbaugh fan or a Wolverine fan, but. Oh my God, that is maybe one of the greatest epic moments I've been a part of to have 10 years of frustration, you know, uh, to get that demon off them. And, and especially with the snow falling, this incredible setting of Hollywood director couldn't have done it better, you know, no. and, uh, Mr. Brightside playing the whole freaking game. Holy cow. The band coming out of the tunnel is still the best, one of the best spectacles in sport. But yesterday at Spartan at uh, Breslin, they were, they were chanting, um, just like football, just like football. So it was kind of cool. Listen, <laughs> I, I want to get you guys off here. There's a game to watch. I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your time. You're welcome. Of course I'm coming on. There's recruits in Michigan. All right. Come to Virginia. Send them my way. Yeah, Lars, you have no idea how many times I've told people, you and John both, I've just, I, I can't tell you how just, I've, when you get a chance to talk to you guys, you're just good guys. And I, and I think that's the, you know, you answer phone calls and, and I think that's something that sometimes we don't realize as coaches. Somebody asked me how I've been able to get to all of these coaches. It's a really simple thing. You pick up the phone and talk to them and they, and they respond. And that's, that's the beauty of this sport. And I think that's something I, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated. So we'll post this online on uh, tomorrow. And uh, again, have a great season, both of you, John, you too. And then the guys that were online, uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, have a great season guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Greg, for having us on.